throughout my career, throughout the time that I was working in Indian country, I mean, I was either a politician or a lawyer advocating positions, advocating for Native rights, advocating for fishing rights, advocating for, you know, uh, the Native people. And to get on the bench and all of a sudden you can't advocate for anybody, you're just you're an arbiter of these positions, right? And thankfully, though, I, did, I didn't get a lot of Native cases in front of me. In Prince Rupert, I did. I got a few cases because there's only me and this other judge <laughs> in the whole town. Uh, judge Krantz, bless her soul, she's passed on now. And, um, uh, but I had Louise in front of me in one case there. She came up and we, uh, well, Louise, she never changed a bit. And uh, throughout the time that I was working on that decision, I would refer back to her factums that she, she brought forward, right? It was one of those cases to do with, um, and it was a good case for me because it was, it was about self-government and how, how two different tribal councils or two different Aboriginal groups should, should interrelate in relation to that. Which and case was it? I can't remember it now. Um, I don't know how well I did actually in writing that, but I remember that case. Uh, and it was a pleasure seeing her in court. And it was interesting for me, actually, because I started out my career working with her as, as a research person. She was a lawyer, and then I, then I was working with her as an Arlington student. Then, of course, as a lawyer when I had my own practice, and then seeing her in court as, as, uh, as a lawyer appearing in front of me as, as a judge. So <laughs> It was always a pleasure. I don't think not a lot of people understood that her and I had this history, right? <laughs> this relationship. <laughs> and, uh, um, of course, you know, you have to disabuse your mind of all that. Look at the case in front of you and decide, which I try to do but my best to do, right? In, in that circumstance. But it seems to me it was one of those overlapping cases that had to be resolved between two different family groups. So very tough, very tough to do. Mm -hmm. What do you consider the most exciting or meaningful part of working in Aboriginal law? Oh, there's, um, I would say, being in court, of course, is exciting. I mean, uh, working on the cases and bringing matters to court. When I had my practice, of course, I had a lot of, uh, I used to do a lot of fishing cases. Sometimes I'd have 20 people in tow with me going to court and putting a case through and organizing it so that we could distill the, the principles down and then put a case forward that would resolve all of these other cases, right? Um, you know, judges, of course, and, and the court system itself is, not, not that predictable, and, and you never know. You've got to sometimes go back and talk to your clients and say, "This didn't work out. Or, We're not going to be able to do this." You know, um, managing your cases is always a challenge. <clears throat> um, what was exciting for me, though, sometimes is when we'd actually be on the line. Uh, they they call me up to go to. Uh, when, when, when the twin tracking was happening, Leslie and Louise were actually out uh, uh, on the line trying to negotiate, trying to get things settled and calm down. And when you're in that kind of a situation, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty interesting. I've been in a situation where, um, you know, there's a roadblock or something got to go out and try to, try to um, resolve the issue or try to help resolve the issues. And that's, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty interesting. Um, but I mean, law doesn't tend to lend itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's not as exciting as many things. I mean, when you, when you talk about law, people start going to see, oh, 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 what are you talking about law for? That's, a hot, that's not even very exciting. You know? But, um, um, 
locked up, for example, in the, in the room to read the Delgamuk decision after it came out of the um, D.C. Court of Appeal, for example. That's exciting for lawyers. Whoa, you're in a room going over things and then going out to talk to the media afterwards. Or, I, don't know. I was in a room, for example, uh, listening to um, Judge McEachern as he talked to the lawyers and heard witnesses. I went and sat in on some of those hearings during the double of the trial. And um, that was exciting for me as a lawyer. I mean, oh, that's, that's very cool, you know, because that case has got such notoriety, has been, been written about for so long. And yeah, and I remember being in that courtroom, seeing how many people were there listening, the lawyers that were there. Yeah, that was an exciting time, very exciting time. And of course, standing up and intervening on behalf of the Union of ECA Chiefs in the Delgamook decision, that was pretty exciting. Sitting there and having your name called and well, what do you have to say, you know? Mind you, I remember the first case I ever fought, and I wasn't even a lawyer then. I was in law school. A colleague came to me, and she says to me, Steve, I, I have this case. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. She, she just couldn't do it. She'd frozen up. And I said, what is it? She says, it was a case where a Native woman had purchased a bed, had put a deposit down, but her bed was never delivered. One of these hospital bed cases. And I go, well, what are you doing in the lawsuit? We're trying to get the deposit back. Oh, okay. So I went to interview her and we filled out the documents. We filed a case in. And I said to her, well, I'll sit in the back of the courtroom and the day your case is called just to give you support. I was in my blue jeans. I had my backpack on. I was on my way to law school. I told her I just stopped into the provincial court to be with you. So the judge called her case and she stepped up. And the other party didn't even show up. The bed people didn't show up at all. And he said, well, can you tell me what your case is about? And she, she said, my lawyer's right there. She pointed at me, and I'm sitting in the back room. And I go, <laughs> he says, who are you? And I go, ah, your honor, I'm just a law student. I was I'm from the legal clinic. I just helped her. I'm just here for her support. He looked at me and said, well, do you want to ring your case in? I'll let you do it. I go, really? OK. Put my backpack down, took my coat off, put her on the stand, and, uh, and led the evidence into, into the record for her. I walked her through her statement and whatnot. And that was my first ever case. I won it. Of course, the other side didn't show up. It doesn't matter, right? You won. <laughs> win's a win. <laughs> <laughs> and that was exciting. For me, that was like, well, you know, that's what you dream about doing, right? Going into court and fighting for your clients. And Yeah, I mean, some of the best things, though, is sitting in negotiations when you're negotiating. Um, sitting across the table. I remember sitting in a room one time with a mayor on one side and the tribal chairman on the other side. And they were yelling at each other, and I was the uh, uh, legal advisor sitting there. I said, you guys sit down and shut up. They both looked at me and go, okay. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> this isn't getting us anywhere. We need to discuss this, right? <laughs> and sometimes, yeah, yeah, negotiations can be pretty interesting. Can be pretty cool as a lawyer when you're there, sitting there and, and having negotiations. So yeah, it was pretty cool too. <laughs> anyway. But generally, law isn't all that exciting. It's not like football stars or hockey stars. Lawyers, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> They're pretty exciting. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but I got to meet some very interesting lawyers. I met Tom Berger one time. Fascinating guy to talk to. And, um, oh. Harry Rankin, when he came up, Chilliwack, and he defended some of our boys up there, got to meet him. Oh, man. Uh, Ed Oliver came up to Chilliwack one time. I think his Mercedes, not Mercedes, he had a Bentley, a silver Bentley, parked right outside the front of the courtroom. Everybody went in to watch Ed Oliver, because he was 
He had such a reputation, I got a chance to meet him, to, to sit and chat with him. Yeah, so Alf Scow, great, great judge, God bless his soul, passed on just a few days ago. So you meet some really, yeah, you meet some pretty interesting people in this life. Um, yeah, when did I graduate? I graduated in 1985, was called the bar in 86, so I've been a lawyer since 85, I guess, so that's what Who would have thought I got this far, you know? <laughs> and how my mom got me into law school when she wanted me to go, she said, she said, I'm gonna have this lawyer pick you up at school. I was at I was at law school, I was in university at the time. So Andy Thomas, that's his name, Andy Thomas. Andy, yeah. Who's a who's a lawyer in Chiller, picked me up. I was in second year university. He drove me to a house, and there was, like I was telling you, this was during the hippie era, right? And there was there was a white two-story house. It was a pretty skinny-looking house, and the grass was not cut in the front. They had a goat there, I think, and there were kids running around, no shoes on, and it looked, kind of looked like the Beverly Hillbillies. You know? And he brought me in, and a guy with a long beard sitting there and his wife with a print dress, and they brought me some corn cakes to, to eat with tea. And me and Andy were sitting there chatting with him. Then we left. I remember there was even a bed in the living room where there's, you, know, you don't ever think there's a couch, but there was a sort of an iron bed in there. And, I, and he I get back to his car, and he says, do you know who they were? And I go, no, he says, they were law students. They were law students. Holy crow. And, uh, <laughs> They were working their way through law school, you know. And when we got to his place in Cholwak, uh, he gave me a book called um, The Life and Times of Clarence Darrow. So uh, he says, I want you to read this book. I'd been to the university, but I'd never read a whole book. No kidding. That's, that's a real true confession. I'd never read a whole book. I mean, you read excerpts from your textbooks, but I'd never read a novel. I'd never read, because reading wasn't that great. And I was a very slow reader. Read really slow. Still read slow. Anyway, I put the book under my bed. I stayed there. Oh, golly. I was in university until the second year, then I left. I came home and got married. And Got on council, started working on logging. I was a logger working in the bush. And then one year, I forget what year it was, I found that book again. It was dusty and it was in a box somewhere, I forget. And I read it. I started reading it. And I read about the monkey trial. I read about his work with children working in coal mines in the United States. And, uh, I read about how he was helping people that were poor. I really admired him for what he did in his life, with his life in the law, right? And when I remember sitting there one year and way up in the mountain, I was looking over the valley and I thought to myself, I don't have to be doing this for the rest of my life, working in the logging industry. Um, I could actually go back to school and become a lawyer. So that's what I did. Too. I was 31 then. I went back to school. <laughs> and never looked back after that. It was a long time though before we started actually making any money doing the law. Because when I got out of law school, opened oh, my practice, everybody else was getting paid except for me and Karen. We weren't getting, making any money at all. And so it's not really a, a big money maker unless you're in a law firm. But it's the way to get experience, so I did it for three years. I got my import experience, and it was all right. <laughs> anyway, so what else do you have? Um, 
I'm curious to know a little bit about how, like, what drives you as, like, in Aboriginal law. What drives me? Well, uh, you know, the, um, oh, I remember going back home, opening up my law practice. And we rented a, uh, Caroline rented a, a space in the old Safeway building next to the legal aid office, just a block away from the courthouse. We didn't have any furniture. And we didn't even have a way of painting the building. So the court workers arrived and they painted it. And the Indian bands got together and they bought us desks and chairs for the front and uh, plants, things like that. So we got, got a little bit, borrowed a little bit of money from the bank and we started working, hired a secretary and we started working. I remember going to court one day and, and uh, one of the lawyers walked up to me, he's a lawyer from Abbotsford. He, he said to me, you're Steve Point, eh? I go, yeah. He said, I'm losing clients to you because of you. And I said, really? Ah, I didn't know that. He says, yeah. He says, uh, every native client that I've got has come up to me and said, we don't need you anymore. We've got our own lawyer now, Steve Point. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was everybody's lawyer. I mean, like, native people would call me out of the blue and say, Steve, could you go down the court and tell them I can't come until tomorrow? Okay, bye. <laughs> I go, who the heck was that? <laughs> it, was this, it was like this, uh, this notion that, 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 that we never, in Salt Lake, never had a native lawyer before. I mean, I was the first one to come back to my community. And in fact, the first one, not really the very first one, maybe the first, first two or three that had a degree in anything. <laughs> but definitely the first lawyer, so. And Monday morning, you go to court, and there's all these native people there. They're all people that you know, too, people that were from the communities. And they didn't ever follow through their cases. They always pled guilty. They always go in and, yeah, I did it, I did it, I did it. Get their fine and go home. You know? And the same was happening in, in Little When I went up to, to, uh, to Lytton to do a case one time, and, uh, and um, they were telling me how court worked in Lillowood. Lillowood only opened on Monday morning and most of the cases were native and they, everybody would plead guilty and they'd all be gone by noon. I was going, nobody fights their cases because they never believed in the system. You know, they didn't believe that they would get anything from it. And so when I started working in, in, in the law, right, um, doing criminal, criminal cases, working with young offenders, people start coming. They would start, they would say, you know, I, you know, I fell down or I, I got hit by a car or, you know, things like that. Stories that you heard and they want you to help them, you know, because there's no one else. They didn't want to talk to anybody else. Well, I had one guy who was hit by an ambulance while he was riding his bike. An ambulance. And, and um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a bit overwhelming. But what drives you is the simple fact that um, Native people are, are, are uh, they've been marginalized to the edge of society. They're not part of mainstream. This isn't their justice system either. You know, this isn't, you know, the whole government infrastructure. It's not their government, you know. And they're, they're more or less um, dragged into it from time to time. A lot of them don't even want to go to hospitals because they just don't get treated very so um, being kind of a, a guide a little bit in, in the system, that's what they, that's why they came. Kind of. they, uh, so I get called to schools to just talk, you know, and, and, and I, I began to get parents coming in and saying, could you talk to my son? Tell him to smarten up. And I'd be going, well, how do I get this role? 
Steve Point is going to talk to you, you know, the whole gully. <laughs> I'm going to straighten their kids up now. <laughs> and, and yeah, it was, a, it was an odd place to be, but you're dealing with Aboriginal people, they're oppressed, they're poor, they're uh, shell shocked from colonialism, they're, they're uh, needy, you know, so you open your office as a lawyer and you become someone that could help them. And so that's what I become. And what drives you is the simple fact that there's a lot of bad things that happen to many people that they need help with. And there's no one really there to, to give them that help. Except for the court. Well, the court workers are good. I mean, when you're in court, they help with that. Uh, but um, after that, there's not a lot of, at least when I was there, there were very, very few Native people in the system working for the natives. And so, yeah. That's a big job to be sort of an awesome weight to sort of put on to you too and high expectation in your own community. But yeah. It was good though when I was doing it. It was really good. <laughs> okay, I have one final kind of question. Um, kind of two parts. What do you think are the most important issues in Aboriginal law today? And where do you see or where do you want Aboriginal law to go in the future? Well, the most important issue, I, I think, in Aboriginal law is the definition of around theory, at least, about what Aboriginal title is. Um, I mean, we, we've really, since St. Catherine's Millings, we've, we've kind of moved the mark up lawyers have and judges have. You know, it started out as a usurpatory right, and now it's something not total ownership, but something a little less than ownership with expanded rights and and uh, the right to be uh, uh, the right to be consulted if you're there's some, some infringement now um, there's there's a right to possession to, to hold on to the land and and, there, and uh, you know there's expanded fisheries rights, fishing rights on the spare decision. Yeah, there's there's been a great movement I think in the law regards to the definition of Aboriginal title, and that's, that's clear. I think that what, what's happening in the political realm, though, is informed, and in the international realm is informative because they're moving towards something like co-sovereignty, something that, that helps the, uh, uh, flesh out a different theory of Aboriginal uh, The courts need to catch up with that somehow, and uh, uh, we need to find a way of conceptualizing that so that it fits within framework of the King Constitution. Um, I think where, where Aboriginal law needs to go, though, particularly in the area of family law and in the, in the area of property law, it is, uh, uh, is the whole idea of um, clarifying and formulating, um, bringing Aboriginal traditional legal systems into the judicial, into the Canadian law system somehow. I was thinking about writing a paper, and I, I, I still might, but the title of it, what is, what is it that Aboriginal communities, Abor, you know, that Aboriginal Turtle Island, Native people, what have they brought to the justice system? Right. Um, you know, what, what we've brought to the justice system is our perspective, our worldview, which is quite different from European. And out of that worldview comes our traditions, our legal traditions around uh, how we resolve conflict, uh, how, how we deal with um, um, bad people, for example. And, and, uh, um, so our, our legal traditions inform things like family and children that are uh, in need, that sort of thing. And, and that, that sort of thing needs to, to sort of, we need to bring some of those things, unpack them in the justice system and find a respectful place for them in the justice system um, without necessarily creating another silo called Aboriginal justice, you know. Um, um, and I think that, that if they can do that, then, then, uh, then eventually maybe they will have their own justice system. But for now, I think where we need to go is, is, is to begin to define and to un, unpack that whole question of the whole area called traditional legal, uh, traditional 
Aboriginal justice uh, laws and to see what that looks like and you know, to try to find a place for it. Do you think a lot of like seeing what that looks like is working outside of the court system first and then or is it kind of coexist at the same time? Or? Well, take, take the area for example, and I, I had this court case happening out of Haida Gwaii where, where, where children are being taken from a mother, right? And, and normally you'd go into court and you'd, you'd call the social worker and you know the social worker would say what's going on in the family and and you know whatever, why why they think the child is at, at distress and then the lawyer for the family would come forward and say you know okay this is what the mother thinks and this is what the mother plans to do you know how she wants to improve her life to get her children back or whatever well. That's based on the definition of what a family is from, from a European perspective. But when you begin to look at a family from an Aboriginal perspective, that includes everybody. I mean, everybody that's, that's, that's connected to the family. Grandparents, uncles and aunts, neighbors, that sort of thing. This, this, this is their family, you know. And, 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 and that sort of process of conflict resolution is, isn't adversarial. It's circular. It's like they begin to talk and, uh, together circle to, to understand the, what, what needs to happen. And when you allow that to happen, as I did in this case in Haida Gwaii, I went, took the, I moved the, the hearing out to the old massive hall and we sat all day and listened to witnesses from the, from the neighbor. The bus driver came and gave evidence, which was very cool. They opened it with a prayer and the elders had their button blankets on. It was like they had kind of took over this hearing about the mother. And at the end of the day, we heard great things about the mother. You know, how she was being supplied with deer meat and cockles and clams by neighbors. And how she would go and clean houses and how, how she had so much work to do. And, 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 and um, you know, it was the community that stepped forward and said, this is how this should be fixed. And, and it was fixed that way. The next day, the lawyers came in and said, we're going to do this. This doesn't have to proceed, and the children are going to go back to the mother. You know? And so, when when the justice system allows itself to um, make respectful space for Aboriginal traditions, right, and allow that tradition to sort of uh, play out within the judicial system, you can come up with a different solution. You can come up with a different place than just well, the mother can have her children back in six months if she does this, this, and this. It's like a sentence from a youth court, you know. Um, and so I find that that's, that's important, right? That's really important. The other area is when moms and dads decide to, to go their own way. And they've got kids on the reserve and they've got a house, a car, and property. There isn't any real, you know, the Family Relations Act doesn't apply in reserve of the property. And, and the federal government, the Indian Tech, doesn't have any division of assets. And, and often the mother will get removed from the reserve because she's not a member there. She's living there. Or the father will, depending who, who's. So there isn't any rules around the division of assets. And it creates a very uh, bad situation, right, where, you know, if they did have rules uh, that were traditional to that community, that, that would be respectful, then you know there would be a way to fill that void right now, which is which is a void. So yeah, I think there's there's a there's there's uh, areas like that. Criminal law. I mean, um, not everybody needs to go to jail. Um, I mean, we've always talked about the rights of the uh, offender and the rights of the the victims, right? And uh, what I've done in some of my cases is to bring them together in a room and sit them down and say, well, how do we solve this, right? You know, because you've got to go back to that community. You've got to live there, you know. Um, and and um, when, you give, when you give voice to the circle and you implement what the circle is talking about, you actually can come up with different solutions again. Solutions that make sense within that community, not not in Vancouver or Abbotsford where they're holding the court, but in, in, in that community, it makes sense there, you know. So, yeah, when you make when you make respectful space for Aboriginal law and traditions, you, you, you end up at a different place, which I think makes more sense for Aboriginal.